The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Is the debt ceiling really that important? Or are you being played? Is it deadlines and lies? How important is it? Well, they're going to gin up the fear in the next couple of weeks, and they're going to try to jerk your, uh, uh, your fear strings so that they can get done what they want, and they want to drive eyeballs. So we want to talk about that. But if the, if the, debt, if the, if, if the government is really seriously close to default, why is Warren Buffett buying billions of dollars of treasuries? Because he's more of an insider than just about anybody. And then I'm going to talk about uh, commercial lending and real estate. we got to talk about that again and then brace yourself for what's coming. I've got three different topics. I'd like to tie them all in together because they are related. And they're going to be important or they could be very important. Now, so let's talk about the debt ceiling first. So basically, I'm just going to give you a Cliff Notes version of what's happened. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh informed us that essentially all funds will be exhausted, all available funds as early as June 1st, but left open the possibility it could be a few weeks after that. Folks, if they don't, as long as they pay the interest and principal payments of, of treasury bills coming due, they're not in technical default. They can put off playing in government employees and especially Congress themselves. Uh, let's start with that, right? Um, and they can normally push it out for a couple months. So why is all the fear? So it says up until this point, most people thought the Treasury would be able to pay their bills all the way through July, but now it's been moved up to June 1st. Okay. Now, that only leaves Congress two weeks to negotiate because there's only a two-week overlap that both the Senate and the House are in session together. Wow. Me thinks they might have known that and they kind of they're ginning up this fear. Okay. Anyway, what does that mean? Well, it means that they just raise the odds of a temporary extension. I can't imagine how, no matter how reckless they are, how they can let the country default when they can just do a temporary extension. Now, are we looking at a full-blown default, possibly? Probable? No. Will there be a month or so of unpredictability and market volatility? Possibly, yes. Probably, yes. We're going to talk about that, what that means for the markets in just a few minutes. But why all this? Why are they doing all of these, all of these things to get you uh, fearful? So there's a, another, uh, uh, a few facts on commercial real estate and lending. Look, folks, I know I beat this to death the last couple months, but this is why this is so important. They tell you the banking crisis is over, right? Here's a fun fact. Commercial loans dropped 42% from the fourth quarter of last year. So in six months, commercial lending's dropped 42%. It's dropped 56% year over year. And 46, 42, and 42% from the beginning of the year. So the lion's share, two-thirds of that drop has happened this year. So the rate of commercial loans dropping the demand is accelerating. Okay. What is the biggest asset on small and regional banks balance sheets? Commercial lending. Now, I told you before that, you know, apartments generally do pretty good, especially senior assisted living uh, and certain things, but it's really the office buildings that are really in trouble. Well, apartments actually have suffered a drop in demand as well, uh, posting their largest drop since the 2008 financial crisis. So in any event, oh, $450 billion in commercial real estate loans are scheduled to be re need to be renegotiated this year. That's per J.P. Morgan. And they estimate 20% of commercial loans could, could default. I think that's a little bit high. I think they're trying to put a little fear in there. But the whole point is, that's really what they don't want you to look at. That's what they don't want you to see. Next article, you can read this in the show notes. I'm just going to hit the highlights. It says, brace yourself. Brace yourself. 2008 is coming. Now, this guy's a perma bear. He's very bearish. But he said in April 2008, Technically, we were, quote, technically in a mild recession. This is what Yellen and, and Bernanke were telling us. This is what they were saying, that we were in a mild recession. By September, we were in full-blown full credit crisis dumpster fire. 
So in four months, three months, we went into full-blown housing crisis, okay? Um, now, uh, a few days ago, we were told there was no banking crisis. Uh, but then remember, Janet Yellen in April in 2008 said real estate was just fine. Okay, now, um, um, then the next one is punish, punish billions of dollars leaving the banks. Okay, now. The largest bank failures of all time, Washington Mutual, that was in 2008, $386 billion. The next three in order, First Republic, SVP, that's Silicon Valley Bank, and Signature Bank. Three of these out of the four occurred in the last two months. Zion and PacWest stock trading was halted the other day because they were down over 30%. Okay. Uh, First Republic owns loans that can't be securitized, so that's another problem for them. The whole point is that the banking is the real crisis, and that's what and real estate, and that's what they don't want you to see, and that's why you're actually seeing a bifurcated market where you're seeing some sectors very strong and some sectors very weak. So now, is the tech sector rallying? Because of earnings and their beating earnings and their forward-looking guidance is getting better, which, according to the story, that's the case. Or is it actually because investors are putting money into tech stocks that have a lot of cash because that's their way of playing safety? It really doesn't matter. But if you had told me at the beginning of 2023 that tech stocks would be the strongest sector in the S and P after being the weakest in 2022. I wouldn't have thought that. And that's why we got to check our brains at the door and measure what is happening while it's happening and make adjustments accordingly. So with that, I'm going to go to the, uh, yeah, I'll go to Don first and see if Don's got any questions or comments on that, on any, on any of those number one treasuries the bonds, what the treasury bonds and interest rates are kind of telling us, and that would be tied to the dollar, and then how the markets are reacting, the, the stock and, and, and the markets. So basically, the bottom line is, uh, as long as you're inside this range, 4070 to 4150, this is uh, what the market uh, valuation that's being assigned is, and uh, breakouts above that are failing, breakouts below that. Are failing. That's what we're keeping an eye on. You can, you can really have uh, one more tight range here that we've been holding around the forty-one twenty area. Uh, so, and it looks like you've been uh, making higher lows, right? It looks like you've been making higher lows just recently. Yeah, that's really the, just this month, though. Yeah. Um, argue that we're making lower highs too. So re really, you know, you can kind of see a big triangle that we're in here and uh, which way would we break out of? Uh, that's part of the question, but over a bigger picture is this, uh, this tighter range that we're in. So that's what we're monitoring. There's gonna be a lot of jockeying around in there, but um, we're trying not to get too excited when we get up to the top of the range or too depressed when we sell off down to the bottom of it, because that's, uh, just the market that we have right now. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. All right. So let's, let's go to the mailbag and then we're going to come back. And, and, and by the way, folks, there are a couple other articles in the show notes. Uh, it's uh, six estate bills before Congress, rut row, actually, Four or five of them are actually pretty good. They're actually going to lower or reduce or one's even to eliminate the estate to have the death tax. And then one is very egregious and going to be put a, put a higher estate tax on it. But I'll let you read that. And then on the regulatory front, these SEC climate rules, they were going to make all kinds of onerous climate regulations. It looks like that's on the ropes and being challenged by all the states, which actually is in a pretty good um, um uh, pretty good. Uh, that's good. That's actually good. All right. So I'm going to read the mailbag and then we'll go specifically to the markets after that. Um, so this is a good one, Don. Um, uh, what do you make of stocks that might be considered excessive debt over 125%, but ROE plays a role too? Uh, reason IBD just popped up with three stocks and all had higher debt 
higher debt, especially when, the ticker W-E-N, 700 plus percent debt load. Same sector as CMG, Chipotle, CMG, which has a much better ROE to debt ratios. Thanks, Kay. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. That was Don's answer. The reason I beat it popped up. And so he said, I picked CMG. CMG just looked better. Uh, my thought, this is my personal thought, uh, free cash flow to, to equity is a very good measure of safety. Uh, it's ability to pay back. That's when you're doing underwriting for bonds, though. But free cash flow can be too conservative for growth stocks because if they're hoarding lots of if they're making a lot of cash, but hoarding it, that means they're not spending it on their new growth. Growth companies normally want to plow all their revenues back into future growth. As long as they have a high growth rate, you don't really want necessarily high free cash flow to equ equ unless they're just making so much money. But if they have a good setup with high debt and free cash flow, that's a, that's a good sign. But normally they, if they have high, if they have high free cash flow, they're not going to need a lot of debt. Uh, here's another one. This is a, another good one. Another great video this evening. I can't believe how much time and effort you put into making sense of the, making these videos. They are full of such great information and so much detail. I'm just worried you're getting burned out and hopefully the young bucks will step up sometime soon and give you much deserved break. On, here's the question. On O-N-O-N, -O -N, are you planning on holding into earnings? Just curious on how you plan to play this. Thank you, CK. This is Don's answer. Hi, CK. You can't get burned out doing what you love. Great question on O-N-O-N. -O -N. As long as it holds a 21 exponential moving average, I plan to hold into earnings. In the video prior to ER, I will discuss the calculation on how I size the earnings. Folks, if you guys want that, uh, how he positions size, just email me or email Don. And no, we'll... I haven't done it yet. Oh, you haven't, haven't done it done yet. I haven't done it yet. I'm going to do it next week before they report earnings. Oh, I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, so then my answer, me, classic Don, you're not going to believe it, but these guys, meaning the team at Revere, uh, actually are doing group text on stock ideas, trading videos, hedge fund interviews, et cetera, into the night, and literally they continue in spurts over the weekend. I kid you not. These guys do not turn off. They love it. Cheers, Dan. Uh, CK, I love it too, following you on Twitter. I can see the boys are very smart and obviously seem to have a real passion for the business. They will be Don's mini-me's, laugh out loud. Great addition to the team. Uh, by the way, speaking of following us, you can follow any of us. It's at the number one, Danny Stewart, at D Vanden Board, at Michael J. Ramos 7, or at Ted Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G, or at Connor J. Bates. And then Alex, who is actually uh, a consultant of ours, is at the underscore optionator. So anyway, that was the second mailbag. And then the um, um, this is one that's actually uh, a really good one. I had a phone con. This wasn't really in the mailbag, but I had a phone conversation and it, with a client that called me and said he's got an elderly mother and she's got three hundred and fifty thousand dollar account and she's got like three hundred and twenty five is all capital gains. She's owned Apple and Microsoft for year, decade, long time. So really, her cost base is about twenty five, thirty thousand. Now it's you know three hundred in capital gains. He said, should I sell it to protect the gains? Ooh. How much, how good a help is your mom in? What she do? Because if they sell it, now they got to pay 20% capital gains on roughly $300,000. But if they wait till she passes and the two kids inherit it, they get a step up in basis. There is no capital gains. So the question is, do you think the market is going to go down more than the capital gains you'd have to pay? That's, that's a tough question. But it's not just all or nothing because there's ways to hedge. So we could actually take that account and we could buy some puts underneath it during stressful times when the market's under pressure to hedge the Apple position or the Intel or the Microsoft so that you don't have to sell it and you can hedge it and then you could roll covered calls above it to kind of finance the put. So there are ways to do things a little bit more clever, but that's a very good question for people that have elderly parents. It's not just all, see, because a lot of times what they do is they know that mom or dad is, is you, know, high, you know, they're getting to the end and they know that it's getting imminent. And so what they do for ease of use, they've got two or three kids are getting everything ready to disperse the estate. They go liquidate everything two weeks before death. 
so that it's easy. Now they just triggered massive capital gains for the decedent to file their final tax return, and they've got taxes to pay on their final tax return, where it would have been better to let the kids inherit it, and there would have been no taxes. So anyway, that's a very common mistake. But anyway, if you've got any estate plan, uh, uh, planning issues, we do all of the above. We do, we're a holistic firm. I'm very good at it. Just reach out to me. All right. So here is the main overreaching question, because we talked about real estate being in trouble. We talked about the, 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 the um, treasuries and whether they're trying to play you and stroke your fears, and they're just going to extend the debt. Okay, but the real reasons commercial real estate, what are the markets telling us? Is it still bifurcated? Is it still regional banks and real estate is weak and tech is strong? How do you need to play this and what do you need to do? Because if it's going to be a good market, I want to have some exposure. But if it's going to get really ugly, I got to be ready to get defensive quickly. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Don. Don, take it away and it's all you. Well, we. Pr- we pretty much talked about what, uh, I mean, the range bound and everything that I drew out. I don't have a whole lot to add to that, but I will show uh, this stoplight report that I, I tweet out every once in a while and that we uh, keep updated in-house every day. And you can you can see over here on the left side are the 12 main uh, or the 11 main sectors that make up the S&P 500 uh, tech continues to stay strong. That's uh, over 25% of the S&P 500. And then you can see some, the weak sectors, basic materials, energy has been weak for two weeks. Uh, Financials continue to be weak. Uh, Industrials rolled over a bit yesterday, but XLY, XLK, and XLC, these are the big, these are dominated by the big uh, tech stocks, the big tech titans, the big seven. We're talking about uh, Tesla, Apple, Amazon, Google, NVIDIA, Meta, Microsoft. Uh, I, I also, uh, every Tuesday, update the Titan 25. If those 25 big stocks don't roll over, the markets are going to hold up just fine. Well, what we also have been saying, stay away from mid caps and small caps and regional banks and commercial real estate. In every video that we do, uh, and mid caps and small caps, you can see here, I've been on the weak side, NASDAQ 100 has been on the strong side. Uh, Dow faded a little bit this week because some of the bigger cap stocks that are in there at the top of it, the Dow is a price weighted index, uh, like United Healthcare and Goldman. Uh, if they're having a bad week, the Dow's going to have a hard time uh, fighting that. Uh, then we also track the G7. These are our seven growth ETFs. Uh, they don't look too bad. I mean, last week, Toward the end of the week, they were awful. This week, they've improved quite a bit. So um, gr- small growth, and this kind of dovetails in with uh, our le- look at outlook on leading stocks has been neutral to bullish. And then over here, some of the key uh, ETFs that we track, bonds at the top, semiconductors have been a mixed bag lately. Gold was strong, faded the last two days, but biotech, which is the ultimate risk on sector, uh, and home builders have continued to stay strong. And solar's had a big gap up this morning uh, on some news. Uh, So yeah, there's obvious rotation. Uh, It's a mixed bag. If tech goes down, remember the S&P 500 is just a big uh, rotation, rotational, Think about it as a big box and things just get shaken up all the time and money moves from growth to value and vice versa and from one sector to other sectors, depending if it's risk on or risk off. Uh, That's why the S&P 500 is so hard to beat because all the rotation takes place within there. So if money starts to come out of tech, it'll flow into these other sectors. Uh, The only time we would need to get afraid is if we start breaking below those levels that I uh, drew on that S&P 500 chart. Uh, recently, which is 4070 to the downside. Uh, on the other hand, if we break out above uh, 4155, uh, the market is looking more bullish. So yeah, a lot of sector rotation, um, and uh, we're trying to be more patient, knowing that as long as we stay within that range, uh, the market's not going to roll over, no matter what the doom and gloomers say. Yeah, right, right. Well, and 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 look, it's quite possible. 
And look, again, we measure what is happening while it's happening. So it doesn't really matter what I think. But I can tell you, it wouldn't surprise me. I think the probabilities are probably a little higher than 50-50 that you might get a little bit of softness in the markets why they ramp both bond and stock prices, why they ramp up fear a little bit because they're going to gin up this both sides. They're both liars. I'm not taking political sides here. They're going to, you know, the Democrats are spending too much, the Republicans saying, and the and the the Democrats saying, oh, you want to cut Social Security, and they're going to argue about it, and they're going to both make their political stands, and they're going to scare you. And so it could get choppy for a few weeks until they say, ooh, we're filing the little extension, and then you make it, get a market pop. The insiders are going to know before that, though. They're going to know when this deal is actually getting signed and extended, and you're going to see the market probably start to see some relief rally before the deal is formally announced, like a day before. I've seen that before. I've seen that happen. So anyway, all right, Don. So what have the guys got for us today? Uh, Connor's going to talk about breadth. Connor, why don't you uh, go right right ahead? I've got the different uh, charts here that you want to talk through. Just let me know where to start. Sounds good. Yeah, so if you want to start with the NASDAQ, new highs, new lows. Before we dive into it, I just want to talk, you know, the, the markets have been pretty strong lately, but breath has painted somewhat of a different picture to an extent. And I'm going to dive into a couple of the breath charts that we're constantly monitoring every day. So this is the NASDAQ new highs, new lows, just basically measuring, is there more new highs or new lows? And this is still negative. Um, despite, you know, markets up <clears throat> during couple of days this week, this we're still seeing more new lows than new highs. And that's something that we need to see a shift to get some more upside momentum, in my opinion. And we want to see the number of stocks blasting out into 52 week highs versus stocks uh, making new lows. And then if you want to pull up the New York Stock Exchange one. And same situation with the New York Stock Exchange as the NASDAQ, we're still getting negative readings. We're not seeing a uh, a positive thrust and new highs. Um, and yeah, we're monitoring these every day to see if it changes. And when you look at this chart, I mean, in that the strongest rally that we had this year, it was consistently positive readings for that whole time. And now, like Don mentioned, we've been range bound. So we're going up and down. Um, so it, it would be very good to see if we can get some sustained positive readings in this one. And then uh, next one is percent of stocks above 200 day moving average. You can do the NASDAQ one or the S&P, doesn't matter. Yeah, so this is the, yeah, the S&P 500 percent of stocks above the 200 day moving average. And the 200 day moving average is a pretty easy way to gauge if the stock is in an uptrend or a downtrend. You know, Paul Tudor Jones always said, nothing good happens below the 200 day moving average. and it's it's alarming less in the s p 500 uh, less than half the stocks are above this 200 day moving average so you could say that uh, more than half the stocks aren't in uptrends yet and we're still getting a lot a lot of strength of the titans that we talk about that that are helping the indexes but we want to see this we want to see more and more stocks get above the 200 day moving average and this can give us conviction that there's more broad-based participation and more stocks are getting into new uptrends and then yeah if you want to pull up the nasdaq one this one's even more alarming because uh only 30 percent of the nasdaq nasdaq stocks are above the 200 day moving average which is extremely low um i mean when we bottomed in october we got that extreme low reading which uh kind of just you know when when that many stocks are below it often signals a turning point but now we're just uh not getting positive readings. Um, we want to see this get at least over 50 and then hold that 60, 70 area and, and see the majority of stocks above their 200 day moving average just will give a lot more conviction uh, for a rally or for a new bull market. And then the last two are the, the NICE and the NASI. So this is the NICE. These, um, these are other breath indicators they, they're based on net advancers taking the advancing issues uh, 
versus the declining issues. And it's basically a McClellan oscillator type breath indicator. So this one is for the New York Stock Exchange. And as you can see, if you look back at this chart, I mean, when the, when the signal flips red, that's usually when this indicator is saying bearish. And when you look at it historically all year, it's been a fantastic tool that, that we can use to gauge where the market's at right now. So this one's showing technically showing a bearish signal. It's, it's below the parabolic SAR and it's, uh, it's red now. And then the NASI that Don just pulled up. This one's um, just kind of going back and forth and it just shows, I mean, we're in chop right now. So these, these uh, indicators are gonna give you mixed, uh, mixed signals some of the time. Um, so just kind of in no man's land, but it flipped the NASI flipped back red. So something to keep an eye on. And um, yeah, these are, we're reviewing these every night to give us a, a better gate better gauge um, view of the market. Obviously, we're always looking at the leading stocks. What are they doing? But this is a good tool to help us. And it's helped us all year, especially these ones, as, as they've been good for catching turning points in the market. So that's the breath update. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Connor. Connor. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Mike, what do you got for us this week? All right. Um, by the way, I think that that Paul Tudor Jones quote um, has been misattributed because I'm I'm pretty sure I heard Don Vandenbord say that first. So uh -huh. I don't know about the origin of of, uh, right of that yeah. one. Um, and j just be just before I get into my segment, can I can I quickly uh, touch uh, touch on the um, the the commercial real estate regional bank thing, or should I just go straight? Sure. To the no. No. I go for it. I want to hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. So basically, um, a, a problem for the regional banks with, with these commercial loans is that unlike, um, unlike a, a normal mortgage on a house, these, these loans are called uh, like bullet loans or balloon loans. And what that means is that they don't amortize like a mortgage and they, um, you have interest payments and then at the end, you owe the entire principal amount. And these rates reset every five years. So what happens is that um, basically as the, the prices of these commercial properties drop with the increase in interest rates, so you've got a, a, a double situation where you're now resetting every five years at this higher rate, you've lost value of your property. So a lot of, um, a lot of property owners, they can't afford these higher rates, so they can't, they can't, um, they can't refinance. And they also, um, a lot of them, when it, when it comes time due to pay off this entire principal amount, this, this huge balloon amount at the end, a lot of them don't have the cash to do that. What they normally do is they extend the loans to, a, to another term, let's say another 30 years. But a lot of banks now aren't extending those loans because of the, um, the loan to value, the, the property values of, of their holdings. So unlike unlike mortgages and and um actually not mortgages but unlike a lot of loans the the commercial real estate loans are non-recourse which means that the banks actually can't go after any other assets aside from the property itself so a lot of the the commercial property owners um you've got big funds like blackrock they, the best solution for them the easiest thing to do is just hand in the keys and then the the uh, commercial um the regional banks get stuck with all of these properties um, and they've taken a huge loss on their on their loans so so that's that's a big problem and and a reason why um the regional banks could be in trouble with these uh commercial loans um just trying to explain it as as simply as possible and then um and then so so the sec my, my segment today um this actually relates to um a mailback question about um return on equity. And I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. But basically, um, return on equity is is one of uh, many different ratios that you can use to um, basically these ratios provide you with insights regarding a company's performance, and it allows you to quickly compare the performance of different companies. So a pretty common ratio that many people may be familiar with, you can see it on MarketSmith, is the return on equity. And what return on equity tells you or what it shows you is the ratio is net income. So the earnings over average total equity. 
And this tells you how much you're earning as a, as a shareholder or the company is earning on the equity invested in the business. And the problem with this metric is that it's not very useful when you're comparing different companies because companies have different levels of interest and tax payments. So to factor all of that in, return on capital is more useful, in my opinion, than return on, equi return on equity for comparability purposes because return on capital uses something called EBIT, which is earnings before interest and tax. And um, that's, that's better because then you can compare companies with different levels of debt and differing tax rates. And using operating earnings before in interest and taxes allows us to view and compare the operating earnings of different companies without the distortions arising from the differences in the tax rates and debt levels. Um, so what return on capital tells you is it compares actual earnings from operations, EBIT to the cost or EBIT to the cost of um, the assets used to produce those earnings. So the idea here is to figure out how much capital is actually needed to conduct the company's business. And um, the ratio of return on capital, what it is, is it's um, the, the EBIT over net working capital plus net fixed assets. And working capital is what a company has to fund its day-to-day -day operations. And then in addition to working capital requirements, um, a company must also fund the purchases of fixed assets necessary to conduct its business. So you've got real estate, property, plan, and equipment, and that's the net fixed asset portion of, of that denominator. So in a long story short, return on capital is important because companies that achieve a high return on capital are likely, it shows that they've got some sort of special advantage. And that advantage is what keeps competitors from destroying their ability to, to earn above average profits. So it's, it's their moat. Return on capital is a great way to gauge the, a, a company's moat. And um, companies that earn a high return on capital may also have the opportunity to invest some or all of their profits at a high rate of return. And this, this, is very, um, this, this opportunity is very valuable because it can then contribute to a high rate of earnings growth. It's like um, compounding so effect. I know I blew, yeah. Yeah, 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 I blew through that. Um, if anyone has questions, um, feel free to reach out and, and I can explain it in more detail, but that was just a high level um, breeze through of, of return on capital. All right, Michael. Hey, and I want to, I want to kind of just highlight on a very, very simplistic view. So Michael's got a huge cerebral brain. He loves the fundamental analysis. And, and so return on capital is really how efficient a company is. So to make it real simple, and as an example, say I've got a rent house and it's a hundred thousand dollars and it generates $20,000 of rental income. That's a 20. I'm just going to keep it real simple. Forget all depreciation, all the other stuff. That's a 20% return. If I got a million dollar house and I'm only getting a hundred thousand dollars a year, I'm getting $80,000 more a year, right? So you think, Oh, I'm making more money, but my return on capital is only 10%. It would be better to have 10, $100,000 houses than $1 million house when I'm making 20 a year, you understand what I'm saying? I'm making twice as much money. So you can kind of compare number one, different size companies, but you can also figure out how efficient they are from sector to sector with different, different, different companies. So it actually is, is a good metric. Mike, uh, I appreciate that. Don, do you have anything else before we go out? I do not. I think we've covered all the levels that we're watching, uh, sector rotation, and uh, you can go ahead and wrap it up, Dan. All right. All right. Folks, listen, if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor, send them to revereasset.com. They can go up in the right-hand corner and they can just hit the subscribe button. They can just put in their email address. We won't reach out to them or spam them in any way. It's up to them to reach out to us for a complimentary portfolio overview. Just ask questions. We can put it in the mailbag. We'll talk about it on air. They can stay anonymous. Um, um, you can add a stock, a, a, a portfolio management question, whatever you want. You can email any of us, dan at revereasset.com, don at revereasset.com, Connor, Ted, or Mike at revereasset.com. You can, and you can always call us old school at 855 Real Wealth. We'll talk to you next week on your money.
because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much to that you can keep. 